What's up guys and welcome back to Gabe Miller Music. Today's video is all about how to actually use the Novation Circuit Tracks. This video is going to be divided into two parts. The first part is going to be for complete and utter beginners, and the second part is going to be for returning Novation Circuit users who are familiar with the OG and are trying to get their heads around all the updated features and workflow. So without any further ado, let's jump into the circuit. A quick note, these synthesizers are going to come in at the very end of this video. I'll do a brief walkthrough on how to connect external synthesizers and make them work seamlessly with the circuit. But let's start off with this entirely self-contained. And I'm going to go into this assuming that you've not used a circuit before. There are multiple windows that we're going to be dealing with. A lot of them are labeled pretty darn clearly. And any secondary functions are labeled either like here. So you would hit shift and then click on a thing to get to the secondary view. Or for stuff like this, note expand or uh, sidechain and whatnot, you can either press the button twice or shift click to get right to it. Either of those will work and you can cycle between the two views indicated on buttons like this with two uh, labels. Let's get back to patterns. This is where all of your note data will live. So synth one has eight patterns. You hit this to get down to the second four. Same deal with this, synth 2, MIDI 1, MIDI 2, drum 1, drum 2, drum 3, and drum 4. All of these operate completely independently of each other, and for the time being, we are going to just straight up ignore the two MIDI tracks, because those are what talk to external synths. We'll get back to that. In the meantime, let's back up one step further and start a new project. So all your projects live in here, and all of these can be like switched between super easily. I'm just going to select a blank spot and go from there. Let me go back to patterns. Right now, by default, just the first pattern is selected for each of the tracks. So I'm just going to leave that as it is and go to synth one. So here is the view of synth one. On the bottom two rows, you've got keyboard notes. And on the top, you've got your sequencer. This runs from here, forward, here, forward. Much like in a DAW, this is your playhead. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to hold down a note, put it into here. Now this step has a note on it. And you can see how that runs through. And right now this is just 16 steps, AKA one bar long. And I can do that like this as well. It kind of cuts both ways when entering notes. I can select the step and select a note to go into it. Or I can hold down a note and select a step to assign it to. And if I've entered in a bunch of notes and I play it and it sounds like garbage, like this does, I can go to patterns, clear. Now it's empty or a little shortcut. I can hold down clear, select a step and that'll clear that step. If you want to have longer musical sections than just 16 steps, there are a couple of things that you can do. For one thing, you can double the length of an individual pattern by clicking this button. Now it's 32 steps long, AKA two bars long, and you can toggle between the two windows. If it's green, you're on the first half of the pattern. If it is orange, you are on the second half of the pattern. If that's also not long enough, you can chain multiple patterns together up to all eight. So to chain patterns, you hold down the first pattern in the sequence and then hold down the last pattern like that. In this case, I've chained together four patterns. You can also go all the way up to all eight. So hold down this, go down. Now all eight are chained together and we'll play one after another. It used to be the case on the original circuit that you could chain patterns out of order. That is not the case here, unfortunately, but you can chain them like two to three or three to four and so on, but they do have to be in numerical order. Let me just chain together four patterns and we can start to input notes. And I should mention when step sequencing notes, you can also do multiple. So like this. That's gone to the next pattern, next pattern. Next pattern, back, back around to the first pattern. Or you can actually record something in live. So I want something to kind of work with when recording live. So I'm going to hit shift, click. That turns on the click. That's really loud and I apologize. And I'll hit record and then hit play to start recording. And you can see that playhead lights up red. So let me just start over. You can see that it missed that first note, so I'm just going to program that one in. And it also accidentally double triggered one, so cleaning that up a little bit. 
So there we go. That is my first little four bar melody, four patterns chained together containing all this note data. I cleaned it up a little bit and you'll also notice that it auto quantized it. You turn that off by hitting shift and then record. And now you can record in just completely off the grid. But I want to turn that back on for now because I'm making kind of a more four on the floor, like really basic kind of electronic dance track. Let me turn that click off. So now we've got our part. Let's say I want to change the sound, which I can do at any time, by the way. Hit preset, fairly self-explanatory. And you've got multiple pages of sounds that you can go through. These are not the default sounds. This is a bunch of sounds that I've loaded on via components. So I don't want this note to double trigger. What I want is this note to be held down for longer. So either I could just re-record that or I could go into gate. Gate controls the length of individual notes within a pattern. And so for this first note, I can tell it to be two steps long. Say four steps. And I can do that for however many steps I want to. That's controlled over here. And if it is some shade of pink or orange, that means that it's even shorter than one step. And you can cycle through that. Super short staccato little notes. You can also control velocity, AKA how hard the note hits. Very similarly, so if I want this note to hit really hard, and I want this note to hit really softly, maybe this is a bad patch to exemplify that with, but you've got quite a bit of granularity when controlling uh, velocity. But let me go back to synth one. And let's say that we're good with this. We want to tweak the synth parameters a little bit. These knobs can be assigned to whatever the patch designer wants. Novation has tried to rein that in a little bit and make it more consistent. But bear in mind that if you're using a pack that was made before the circuit tracks was released, these might not quite correlate to exactly what is noted here. Like in this case, you would expect to see uh, this in amp envelope, but it's an oscillator mod. That's kind of a bad example for demonstrating how these knobs work. So uh, there will be some trial and error involved, but by default, uh, this will control some aspect of the tone characteristic of the patch. This might control its movement. This will control like how long or short the sound is. This will control the filter, like the high cut or low cut, depending on uh, what the patch designer has set it to. This will control where that filter is, like the filter cutoff. This will control the resonance. Uh, some form of modulation and some form of effects, sometimes distortion, sometimes stereo widening. Once again, that will change depending on which patch you're dealing with. Let's say that this is too low, which arguably for being a lead, it probably is. What I can do is let that play a little bit, hit shift and up, and that will send the entire pattern up an octave or down, up and down. Send that up an octave. And a pattern doesn't have to be playing for that to work. I just like to have it playing so I can just quickly cycle through all four of them and call it a day. So also to quickly save, just double tap the save button and you're good to go. If you would like to save it into a different slot, you hold down save and select a new slot. Now that is living in both of these and you can mess with them independently. Real quick, let's get some drums going um, so I don't have to turn the click on again. Drums are set up fairly similarly to synth tracks, but there are some key differences that you need to know about. First of all, in here you can select sounds. And you can page through different slates of sounds. These are sounds that I've like loaded on myself from Splice and whatnot. I've also created a $5 uh, one-shot sample pack with a bunch of drum and synth one-shots. You can get that at the link in the description. It's five bucks, supports the channel, gets you some absolutely banging sounds, if I do so so myself. Uh, but let me just program in a kick. Let me just use this kick as an example. So I've got this selected, and now I can just put in steps. But let's say that I want to have a snare going as well. I've got a few options. I could go to drum two and start adding in a snare if I want it to like say play at the same time as the kick. So let's just show that. I can also just record this in live. So that's in there. But if I want to kind of conserve tracks and if I want to have the kick and snare trigger the side chain, I can put them both on drum one and I can have different sounds switch out 
on one drum track. So let me demonstrate how to do that. I'm gonna get rid of these two, and then I'm going to go down a page to that snare. I'm going to mute drum two, which has the existing snare on it, so now. So you'll notice I've just changed this sound, and I don't want this sound to change. I want the sound to stay a kick. So what I'm gonna do is I'll go up, hold this down, and force it to be that kick. It being bright purple means that this step is now locked to that sample. So now, if I choose the snare, these are stuck being that kick. And I can assign that to something else. So now if I change the sample that's selected down here again, it doesn't change these. These are forced to be the sample that is indicated right here in this case. See, that's that snare that we chose. Or if I go up, that's that kick. It's locked into that. And if I want to clear that, I can. Now this can be whatever we want again, but I want to forcibly assign it to this kick. I can do a very similar thing with the hi-hats, which I typically like to put on drum three. This is a decent way to demonstrate it. I can also record those like switches in live. See, I missed this one. And what I just did here is I went into the mixer. So each of these knobs controls the volume of each track and the colors correspond. So I just turned this hi-hat down a little bit. I could also just mute it. You can also get into panning. If you go down a page, you see these change a little bit. And it goes to like a neutral color when it's centered. So that's super basic drum programming. Let me mute this synth for a moment. Just have this really basic little drum pattern. Let's get into micro steps real quick. That's how you're going to get like a hi-hat ratchet or uh, start shifting stuff around. So I'm on drum three, which has all the hi-hats. I'm going to go to gate and I'm going to press it again to get to micro steps. Although I actually note that for sample tracks, these are one of the same. It just takes you to micro steps. For synth tracks, if you press this once, it takes you to gate like I showed you earlier. If you press it twice, it takes you to the micro steps for the synth tracks. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. So let me select this first note here. And these are my micro steps. So if I select all of them, all of that lives on this step, or I can select, say, every other one, which is super nice to have. Uh, that's how you get that effect. So I'll just leave this doing that kind of extreme ratchet right now. And obviously you can get a lot deeper into this, especially if you've got multiple different sounds. You could even do something like this. Select this. Add in that first note, add a little kick roll. Uh, that's messy, but hopefully you get the idea. Let's just keep building. So I'm going to get rid of these snares and then I'm going to make this track perform some other function. So let's say a clap. This will do. It's a bit loud. So let me just preemptively turn that down. And if I want to make sure that I force these, I can hold this down. There we go. And actually, here's a quick little trick that I like to show uh, to first time circuit users, especially making like house and whatnot. If you want a little flam effect, which you often do between like the kick and the snare and a clap sound, you can go into gate, select the step previous, and then put one at the very end of the micro steps. So you hear how the clap triggers ever so slightly early. That's kind of nice. I also want to shorten the sound a bit. It's a bit much. So that's where these controls come in. Oscillator mod controls pitch. Filter envelope controls length. So let's leave it like that. Resonance controls distortion. And effects controls uh, filter. So if you go this way to the left, you get a high cut filter. If you go this way, you get a low cut cut filter. So that's how you shape your sound and you can get to the different settings for different drum tracks just by selecting them. You see the colors up here change. Let's talk about effects. Let's send, uh, say that clap to a reverb. So to get to effects, you hit the effects button and then you've got delay settings up here and reverb settings down here. So you set the size of your reverb essentially, and then you can send stuff to it. So I've got like a medium sized reverb 
And then I'm going to select the knob for drum two, send that to the reverb. That's a gigantic reverb, definitely a bit much. Here's a tiny reverb. Sounds like it's inside of like a bedroom or something. That's a good spot right there. And I've also got a delay, so I can select my delay setting and add that. And I can start to send other stuff to that as well. So say, let me select that reverb again. And everything gets sent to the same reverb and the same delay. So you better make sure that you kind of like where that reverb is sitting and where that delay is sitting, because if you want to have anything else have reverb and delay, it's all going to be the same. So let's add another synth track. Just something super basic. Shit, the sound a little bit. This is a weird preset. Oh, that's pretty good. A bit loud. I want that to get ducked by the kick and the snare. I mentioned sidechain. So to get to sidechain, press this once, press it again, and now you can control the sidechain for each track. So this is the sidechain for synth one. This is the sidechain for synth two. If you go down, this is the sidechain for MIDI one, sidechain for MIDI two. Let me go back up. And this controls which drum track controls the sidechain. In this case, it's drum one by default. I want to keep it that way. And I can set my sidechain level. So right now we're hearing synth two just kind of drone on and on and on. So let me show you what that sounds like. bit much. That sounds a little more natural to me. It's still kind of extreme, but that kind of makes sense for this style of music. Send some reverb to that first synth. A little bit of delay. That's sounding, uh, okay. <laughs> It's definitely not art. Let me show you another property of patterns. Let's say I want this pattern duplicated. I just hold down duplicate, select the pattern, select the slot where I want that duplicate to go. Now we've got two identical patterns and I, now I can modify this. So let's say I wanna add one more note, like maybe a little octave jump right here at the end. And I can toggle between these, chain them together, whatever I want. So let me show you what I mean by toggling between patterns. Uh, essentially, you're launching them. So right now, by default, this is set. I'll mute this for now. That's just going to loop on and on and on. If I want to have the pattern change, I can uh, select it right before I want it to happen. And you see how that flashes when it's ready to change to it and then just lights up when it's properly changed to it. It does it right in time with the groove that you've got, which is super nice. And uh, speaking of time, let's talk about tempo. Hit this to get to tempo and you can uh, up this. We've got a nice numerical little readout with the pads here. And then this controls swing. So if you're trying to get like the drunken drummer effect, you go swing below 50. And if you're trying to get like uh, kind of a triplet swing, you go above 50. I'm going to put it back to no swing, aka 50. And that's how you control that. Also, if you want to tap out a tempo, you hit shift, boom, 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 boom. And you can change that after the fact. That's actually a decent spot for it to be. Let's talk about scales. Next, you can change the scale that these pads are set to. This is the default one right here. This represents a keyboard, essentially. So if I change to chromatic, which is the very last one, you can actually see that laid out like a keyboard. C, C sharp, D, all the way up until it's an octave up. 
and you've got a bunch of other scales to choose from. I advise messing around with this. And then if you want to change it from the key of C, you can do that as well. And that changes everything in the entire project. So I've changed it back to what it was at the very beginning. And from here, if you were trying to make a full song, you would start filling up your pattern slots of full of drums, full of melodies and chord progressions and bass lines, and then start switching between them to build up a larger arrangement. This is where experienced circuit users will be tuning in because we're going to get into some of the more advanced features that the tracks adds. So first of all, let's talk about the scenes. So the ability to add scenes is a new feature of the tracks. This is kind of like the Roland MC 101, really, and I'm sure there's a lot of other gear that can do this as well. Essentially, each scene can contain a combination of patterns, and you can have a bunch of these here in the mixer window. So for the moment, I've got these chained together. Let's chain these together. I like this as a musical section. So to assign that to a scene, I go to mixer, hold shift, select whichever scene I want, that now lives on the scene. So if I select a second scene, you'll see that none of this stuff is chained together. It's all on just the default stuff. But if I go back to the mixer, select the first scene, all that stuff that I set still lives here. And I can switch between them. So check this out. Now this dude is just looping on and on and on because it only has the first pattern selected because that's just the default. And I could change that further. Let me select some blank patterns that don't have any drums in them and have this guy just loop endlessly. Go to mixer, shift, assign it to this scene. So now I've got two scenes with different combinations of patterns. I've got this full one. And I've got this kind of stripped down one. Use the master filter. And that's how you start to build up an arrangement. And you can assign a bunch of these. I would at least attempt to make them in somewhat of a linear order. And you can even chain these if you just hold one down, hold down the next one, just like patterns. And then one will play directly after the other. And just like on the original circuit, you can switch between uh, sessions as well for much more drastic changes in your song. So for instance, you could do something like this. That's kind of a horrible example because these really have nothing in common. So here's a better example. This song I was working on earlier. It's not a huge change. I didn't really need to do that using projects. I could have just done that with a scene, but hopefully that gets the idea across. For making drastic changes where patches change out or a bunch of drums change out or a bunch of stuff kicks in all at once, separating stuff out into projects can be really nice. And you can even use this to build up entire live sets, like a full DJ set entirely generated by this thing, which is really cool. A good example is my song Trippy. On the OG circuit, I switch between projects quite a lot to create a lot of drastic changes within that song. Let's go back to our example project, our very, very good, not cheesy at all sample project. Another ability that this brings over from the original and makes a lot more streamlined is a step automation. So for you newbies, you can automate a parameter. Let me just do that here by holding down record, hitting play. And you see that record that knob movement, but you can also, let me just get rid of that entirely, do it on a step-by-step -step basis. So in order to do that, select a step, hit record, and then change that parameter. And I got to change it for this one now. Let me just have it go kind of back and forth just to give you an example. Now. It's kind of struggling with this because it's a weird, like, arbitrary change. But. That's a bit of a mess, but hopefully you get the idea and see how powerful that can be. You can really fine tune stuff. 
You can also assign step probability, which is neat. This is also new to the circuit tracks. So let me just mute all this. Let me show this with the drums. Let me add another couple of hi-hat hits just to fill in those gaps. And I can start assigning probabilities to each step. So I go to pattern settings. I go to it again to get to probability. And then I can select how probable it is, say, that we're going to hear this ratchet. So set it to halfway. It's not going to play every time. Maybe these I can make super unlikely. This one a little less so. And I can make it so like you're never going to hear quite the same pattern twice. And especially if you have like a track full of sound effects, this can be really nice for uh, creating a bit more interest, a bit more randomness in kind of your effects or percussion or even in your melodies. If you really want to take it that far, uh, you could take this very far if you wanted to. Another thing I want to show you is Mutate. So let's stick with this hi-hat track. Let me duplicate this because Mutate is destructive. It cannot be undone. So I've got a duplicate of the hi-hat track here. So then I'm going to go back to this. I'm just going to hit Shift. Trigger mutate. And you see how it rearranged all the existing notes I had in here. I can also do that for uh, my main melody. Let me duplicate this, send that down to over here. I've had less luck with this, but occasionally it gives decent results. That's actually not bad. And now it's just stuck like that. Maybe I wanna change this note. Not that one, this one. That's actually not too bad. A nice little uh, switch up here. You can see where I'm going with this. This is definitely worth messing around with, but uh, I would always duplicate or do a save as. That way you can always go back if you want to. Another new thing when dealing with patterns is uh, this pattern settings window, which is really interesting and actually ends up being super friggin nice. So let me just start a bass track. And in fact, let me change this preset because it sucks. Okay, this will be a good example. I'm just gonna put in one note, go to gate and then make that note an entire uh, pattern long. So you hear how it re-triggers every single time the pattern loops. You could use a note tie to get that to stop, but that means it is just going to play infinitely, even if you switch between sessions. And so I basically never use note tie. Instead, what you can do is go to pattern settings and I can control the speed of the individual pattern relative to the actual tempo. So I could say, make it half speed. See the cursor moving slowly through it. I can take this even further and make it a quarter of the speed. And they've also got like other little uh, divisions. This is, I think, normal. For some kind of polyrhythmic stuff, if you really want to experiment, you can take this pretty far. Typically, I use uh, half speed the most. You can also do stuff like reverse a pattern, ping pong a pattern, or select random notes. Let me demonstrate that with an actual melody track. So we know what that sounds like. Let's reverse it. And you can see your playhead moving backwards, or we could ping pong it. Or we can do random. This is kind of like mutate, except it's not destructive. It's also not consistent. But if I want to go back on that. So imagine the random step feature that just scrambles everything and probability and like switching between a bunch of sounds and how much chaos you could create. One more thing I should mention before we start connecting up these devices, you can copy patterns from the normal synth tracks to the MIDI tracks and 
vice versa. You cannot copy between drum tracks and uh, synthy tracks. But what this means is that if I'm like not plugged into anything else, I can come up with four instrument parts just on these two synth tracks that would go well together. And then I can copy some of them over to the MIDI tracks, design sounds on these, and then have a full four part arrangement later. That's a totally valid hybrid workflow that I definitely intend to adopt with this thing. So you've got a bit of an ebb and flow. If you are newer to this, you can absolutely get super full arrangements with just two synth tracks, especially if one synth is polyphonic, where I can play multiple notes. You can have a synth pull double duty. I've done many songs just with two synth tracks because that's all the original circuit has. But if you want to expand to include multiple other synths, Let's go ahead and actually get these guys connected up and I'll show you how to do that. All right, we've got quite a bit more on the table now. So let me walk you through how all of this is set up because while there is an absolute rat's nest of cables here, it's actually not all that complicated, which is pretty incredible considering how powerful the setup is. First of all, here is the musical segment that we are working with. <laughs> Let me break this down track by track, although I did make an entire video where I made this uh, from scratch, minus this, I added this after the fact. We've got a bass arp. That's one track. We've got uh, some synth chords. Love this patch. That's a big city great decay patch. We've got MIDI one being sent to the micro freak. And then we've got MIDI two being sent to the Volca keys, and that's playing that little ARP part. Note that this is panned a little bit to the left, the hi-hat is panned a little bit to the right. Add a bit of separation there. And then I've got the kick and snare both on drum one. That way they both trigger the side chain. A uh, little tom fill on drum two, the hi-hats as I mentioned on here, and then uh, a bunch of like little effects on drum four. Let's get into how I have all this routed. First of all, by default, the second MIDI out is actually a MIDI through. If you want to change that, you've got to power down the unit and then hold down shift while powering it on, and then go to the duplicate button and click it and it will turn green. That means that this out is now a completely separate independent MIDI out and can be sent to a second synth. Then you just hit play to get out of that setup window and you're good to go. Another thing to note though, by default, uh, synth one sends out to MIDI channel one, synth two sends out to MIDI channel two, MIDI one sends out to MIDI channel three, and MIDI two sends out to MIDI channel four. Are you confused yet? Essentially what this means is that you've got to keep track of which track sends to which channel because it won't always work the way that you expect it to. Case in point being with the Micro Freak, by default, it's set up to take MIDI from channel one of whatever's trying to control it. So to change that, you've got to go to utility. You can't really see the screen and I'm aware of that, but go down to MIDI and then you can change your input channel. In this case, I changed it to MIDI channel three. That way this track and only this track controls the Micro Freak. That's not the only way to deal with this, especially because this, as far as I know, is a little harder to deal with in terms of setting that up. However, what you can do is go to shift save, which gets you into a different setup window. And this allows you to actually set which channel each track is sending MIDI to. In this case, by default, like I mentioned before, synth one is on MIDI channel one. There are 16 total channels, except for this one, which is reserved for, I believe, project changing. I changed this to channel five, which is just not doing anything because I don't need this to get sent to anything. And then for MIDI two, I made sure that the MIDI two track was sending MIDI out via MIDI channel one. That way, this just picks up whatever is in MIDI channel one and goes, okay, I guess this is what I'm doing right now. And that all works. A little bit of setup, in the beginning, maybe even a little bit of troubleshooting to make sure everything is talking to each other perfectly correctly. But as long as you know what MIDI channel each track is sending stuff to and what MIDI channel each external device is receiving, you should be able to figure it out. And this window right here is how you deal with a lot of that. 
So once all the MIDI stuff is routed and the proper tracks are controlling the proper devices on the proper channels, you can start to deal with the audio side of things. So I've got just a normal audio cable running out of the output of the Arturia Microfreak running into input one of the tracks because that corresponds to MIDI one. And then same deal over here. I've got the headphone out with a little converter cable at the very end of this run into input two of the tracks. And that is now on MIDI two. Now I can actually go into Mixer and do stuff like mute and unmute as you've probably already seen me do. I can add effects. In this case, I've got a ping ponging delay on the Microfreak and then reverb on both devices. And you can even go to sidechain. This is the internal synth sidechain. This is the external synth sidechain. And being able to affect these and sidechain these to the drums is super nice. And you can also choose what triggers the sidechain. In this case, channel one are where the kick and snare are living. So that's what I went with. Now, once you've got all of that set up, everything should work pretty seamlessly. You've got this track, both controlling the Microfreak and accepting its audio and shaping its audio. And you've got this track controlling the Volca keys and accepting its audio input and shaping it. You've basically assimilated these two synths into this device. And now you can just keep all your attention on this unless you wanna like go and twiddle knobs, shape your sound, all that kind of stuff. And from there, you can launch patterns, you can launch scenes, you can change projects just like you would in any self-contained jam. I will say word of warning, if you are working on a song and then like you power the circuit down and power off the synths and come back to it later, make sure that you either don't change stuff on the Volca keys or if you can save presets easily, save that preset, write down which one it was or take a picture with your phone or something. That way you can very easily recall all the parameters of your session. I'm not gonna go into MIDI CCs in this video because I don't fully understand understand it yet, but I will report back once I do. And that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to see the circuit tracks in action, you can check out a jam video or a video where I make beats from scratch using the tracks and the Microfreak. And if you're new to the circuit and are looking to learn more, I did a couple of videos with the original about how to make builds and drops and also full songs. Pretty much all of that stuff will still apply to the new one.